Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be cracking open the green beast that started it all for Microsoft with their debut in the console space with the original Xbox and the GPU that powered its graphics, the NVIDIA NV2A. But before we begin and dive into the video, if you're new to the channel and you enjoy tech breakdowns and tech videos in general, consider subscribing to catch my future uploads. I try to upload at least once a week during my free time. And if you enjoyed this video at all, make sure to smash the like button and comment your thoughts down below. That way YouTube may actually share this video to other people who will enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all of your support. Now let's just end the formality and dive right into this video. So as always, I love to kick off the GPU breakdown series with just a basic overview of the entirety of the system specs of the Xbox before we dive into the GPU and how it worked. For its CPU, the original Xbox had a custom Intel Pentium 3 based chip at 733 megahertz. Its GPU is the aforementioned NVIDIA NV2A, a custom GPU clocked at 233 megahertz. It had 64 megabytes of DDR RAM at 200 megahertz and also included 8 to 10 gigabytes of internal storage. Now just looking at these four basic parts, this hardware made the Xbox more akin to the gaming PCs at the time of its release than any of the other Gen 6 consoles and was also easier to develop for just based off the hardware alone as a result. But we'll touch up on more of that a little bit later. Now I want to dive into the real MVP of the show, the Xbox GPU itself. As I've already mentioned, it was developed by Nvidia in partnership with Microsoft and was primarily based on Nvidia's GeForce 3 architecture, but also incorporated some enhancements inspired by the later GeForce 4 series. Series, such as an improved memory controller allowing utilization of the Xbox's DDR RAM or double data rate shared RAM allowing for much higher bandwidths. Again, we'll break that down later. The NV2A had a 233 megahertz core clock speed, four pixel pipelines, each with two texture mapping units for a total of eight TMUs. These pipelines and TMUs determine how many pixels can be processed per clock cycle and directly affects the speed of rendering images on screen and how the textures are applied to the pipelines, essentially mapping images onto objects to enhance realism. It also had two vertex processing units, which is actually double what the GeForce 3 cards at the time of the Xbox's release, which allows for a large theoretical advantage in vertex processing parallelism, but other factors may cause for that to vary. Vertex processing is the stage in the GPU's rendering pipeline where 3D model vertex vertices are transformed, lit, and manipulated either through fixed function operations or programmable shaders to prepare them for display on a 2D screen. We then have four raster output units, or ROP, to handle the final stages of rendering, blending pixel data, applying depth and stencil tests, and writing the results to the frame buffer for display. The Xbox GPU also had Pixel Shader 1.1 and Vertex Shader 1.1 support, meaning early programmable shader support which gave developers flexibility in rendering effects like lighting, shadows, and textures. The Xbox also had programmable TNL or transform and lighting as well. As far as performance could go, the original Xbox GPU could pump out 932 million pixels per second for a pixel fill rate. It was also capable of 1.86 gigatexels per second for a texture fill rate and provided a total of 20 gigaflops of floating point performance. When you add the features and the hardware that I just mentioned with these performance levels, you can get a clear picture of why the Xbox was capable of some pretty impressive games. Now, I've already mentioned it because this is what the GPU was based off of, the GeForce 3 GPU, but I think it'd be fun to go in here and kind of compare the PC GPU of its time with what Microsoft came up with for its console. You see, the GeForce 3 had 800 to 1000 megapixels per second fill rate, depending on if it was the GeForce TI-200 or the GeForce 3 TI-500 and also had a 1.6 to 2 gigatexels per second texture fill rate and 9 to 13 gigaflops of overall floating point performance, again depending on which specific GPU model we're talking about here. Also, as I mentioned and touched on earlier, the GeForce 3 just had one vertex shading unit. The Xbox's GPU had two, and I already explained the advantage earlier briefly, but now we can look at this a little bit more closely. Unlike console GPUs typical for the time, which many relied on fixed hardware behaviors at that point, the NV2A introduced a fully programmable vertex engine. That means developers could define exactly how vertex operations were executed mathematically and logically by using custom code loaded at runtime. And because the Xbox GPU has double the vertex units, each of these two inside the NV2A could run a vertex program containing up to 136 microcode instructions instead of just one. These programs could include arithmetic operations like addition, multiplication, and dot products. Again, memory bandwidth and other factors outside can reduce the two to one improvement the two vertex shaders have over the GeForce 3, but this was massive for helping the Xbox bring PC level gaming to the living room at a less cost of doing so for the first time. Backed up by the other hardware specs that essentially brute force better graphics and higher performance, the Xbox was built to impress and be as powerful as possible. 
But as you can guess, overall from the specs that I laid out with the Xbox GPU, the real world performance of this NV2A GPU sat somewhere between a GeForce 3 Ti 500 and a GeForce 4 Ti 4200. When you include all the matching specs and improvements over these PC graphics cards with the enhanced memory controller, the hardware was already impressive for the time, and if you add the fact that the developers did not need drivers, unlike the PC GPU counterparts, meaning the devs could talk directly to the metal inside the Xbox, so to speak, to get maximum performance out of it, the Xbox left a lot of people impressed. It meant Xbox games could be optimized like crazy, provide real-time lighting, bump mapping, advanced shaders, and more that allows us to have all the games that we fell in love with back in the day like, of course, Halo 1 and 2, and we even eventually had impossible ports, with air quotes, for the console later down the line, such as Half-Life 2, providing the entire PC experience in one package for the Xbox, tailored to its power constraints from a really high-end PC at the time, and the components in them that would come out after the Xbox was released, and even Doom 3 with all of its real-time lighting and shadows still included and was able to be built from the ground up for the Xbox port specifically and utilized its hardware at its max capability. And of course, we can't talk about the GPU without going into how its memory configuration worked. The Xbox used 64 megabytes of DDR RAM. This memory was unified and shared between the CPU and GPU depending on game and developer need. This memory was clocked at its modest 200 megahertz, but due to double data rate memory, this was 400 megahertz hertz effective and it's what gave the xbox the capability of a 6.4 gigabyte per second bandwidth matching that of the geforce ti 200 even though the xbox's memory had about a 300 less megahertz clock speed to work with and was still only about 24 percent behind the geforce 3 flagship card the ti 500 the memory capacity and bandwidth helped the Xbox have such large and complex games on the system. Aside from that, it is pretty straightforward though. 64 megabytes of RAM is quite a bit more than even the closest competing 6th gen console at the time, and the bandwidth was about double as well. Essentially, in raw power, when you look at the overall specs like CPU, RAM, and GPU, and you combine all these capabilities and hardware features, the Xbox was the most powerful console for Gen 6, there is no doubting that. And why a few games just were not playable in any form on its competitors. Like my two prior examples like Half-Life 2 and Doom 3. But each console's GPU did have a performance spec that was uniquely the best between all of them, and their own unique architectures that had to be developed for to take advantage of the hardware provided in the best possible way. And as a result, each console did bring titles to the table that looked phenomenal and all did incredible jobs providing exclusives for their individual platforms that we all have fond memories over today. But that's all I really have for you in today's video. This video wasn't easy to make in the sense of providing a comprehensive breakdown as they went with such simple hardware, basically PC level hardware, and didn't do anything more unique and intricate like Nintendo and Sony did with their consoles for the time, creating hardware specifically for the purpose of gaming, whereas as Microsoft took hardware that exists in the PC realm of gaming and just general use and kind of made a hodgepodge system to be their first console. And if you look up the history of the Microsoft Xbox, it is quite a fascinating story. And I do suggest doing that if you're interested in this thing to see where the Xbox came from and its origin story. So this video was a pretty basic break. And as a result, that's all I have for you in today's video. I wanna thank you for being here. And if you watch this far and listen to me ramble this much, you are one of my top supporters. Please comment below that you watched the whole video so I can personally reach out to you and thank you. And also share with me some of your best memories and favorite games on the original Xbox if you have any. I look forward to talking to you all in the comments and I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. And I'll catch you all in my next video. Peace.